Hi everybody, I am back with a book trek, book review of The Fate of the Phoenix. The Fate of the Phoenix is a sequel to The Price of the Phoenix, hence the similarity in names. And I'm doing this as a part of Book Trek 2023, the summer of Trek. And this is a buddy read I'm doing with Steve Donahue of the Phoenix books. And it's been interesting because I read these when I was much younger. Then I read these when I was a little bit younger and I read them again now. My opinion of these books has of course changed with time as indeed I have changed with time. I read these initially as a teenager and was just really excited to get some Star Trek stuff to read. But there was something weird going on in these books that I didn't quite understand, but I thought I was sort of getting the message and it was the barely between the lines love affair between Kirk and Spock, which, you know, in the mid seventies, when these were published, you know, obviously that wasn't canon, but there was little oversight of the books from Paramount because they didn't figure there was anything else going to go on with this intellectual property. They didn't realize that this franchise was going to continue for another, what's it been? 50 years, 55 years now. So they just let them do what they wanted to make a little extra money. So the authors of The Price of the Phoenix and The Fate of the Phoenix are Sandra Marshek and Myrna Culbreth, who were, and, and they're still alive by the way, but they were instrumental in the fan fiction movement of the time. Even, even in the 70s, there was fan fiction before the internet, but you read it on mimeographed copies or or something like that. I don't know. I was a little kid in the 1970s. Steve would probably tell you more about that. But as a sequel to The Price of the Phoenix, The Fate of the Phoenix is longer and quote unquote raises the stakes. I actually enjoyed my reread of The Price of the Phoenix this time around. And you can watch that video too to get my full thoughts on it. The Fate of the Phoenix I did not enjoy. And I didn't enjoy it the other two times that I read it either. It's so heavily plotted and so long that to me, it's almost incomprehensible. And um, so anyway, let's get into this sequel stuff, okay? In The Price of the Phoenix, just in brief, you've got a super villain named Omni who rules a planet in the neutral zone called a hole in the wall planet. But he creates a duplicate of Captain Kirk with a device he calls the Phoenix device. It's, it's basically modified transporter technology. And the implications of the Phoenix device are argued at length throughout the book with the idea that this is the most earth shattering and universe changing technology that there is. I suspect they're overselling a little bit, but yeah, this is big stuff. This is a big idea. Ami is a, instead of a humanoid, a vulcanoid, and he's really big and he's really committed to demonstrating what an alpha male he is, particularly by subjugating Kirk. And one of the one of the entertaining things about the Price of the Phoenix is, you know, Kirk's half naked for almost half the novel, maybe even more, and he's just wearing a little bathrobe and stuff. So that recurs in um, the Fight of the Phoenix periodically. Um, I'm halfway through the Prometheus design from the same authors, and uh, Kirk's half naked in a few scenes in that too. It's it's actually kind of entertaining, but. Uh, so anyway, you know, at the end of The Price of the Phoenix, spoiler alert, if you do not want to be spoiled, stop now. But at the end of The Price of the Phoenix, the duplicate Kirk is cosmetically altered to look like a Romulan. Because one of the other main characters in, in this particular novel is the commander from an episode of Star Trek called The Enterprise Incident, which was one of only, I believe, three episodes, maybe four, that featured the Romulans. And in that episode, the commander had fallen deeply in love with Spock. So you got love triangle stuff going on big time in The Price of the Phoenix. So, you know, what are you going to do with two James T. Kirks in the Federation? At least that's what the novel assumes. And so at the end of The Price of the Phoenix, the good guys beat Omni, the bad guy, and Jim Kirk, the, the new Kirk, the duplicate Kirk, goes to live with the commander as her boy toy, basically. You know, they had a name for it in the book. I can't remember what it is, but basically he's her paramour, 
but the authors also really enjoy bringing up the differences in terms of strength between Romulans and Vulcans and humans to the point where humans just seem incredibly frail and weak. And it's one of the things that they're really concerned about when they're talking about taking Captain Kirk and integrating him into Romulan society. So also there is, uh, okay, so now we're segueing into the fate of the Phoenix. In the fate of the Phoenix, one of the plot lines is the commander's relationship with Jim Kirk because it's not like he expected it to be. She's in charge, you know, for, for, you know, she's definitely female, but she's the alpha male of the relationship. And he does not like this, but also he's so weak and powerless that if he doesn't have her protection, he won't survive in the Romulan empire at all. So I don't know. It's, it's an outlandish plot line. I think it's ludicrous. You know, I think as we saw with the, the episode of Star Trek where we wound up with two William Rikers, William Riker and Thomas Riker, obviously they would just integrate that extra Jim Kirk into the Starfleet somewhere. Why wouldn't you want two James T. Kirks, right? So in The Fate of the Phoenix, The Fate of the Phoenix, not only do you have duplicate Kirk, but now they're raising the stakes. Now you have two Omnis too. The villain's back and he's got a duplicate. And his duplicate is apparently so much more evil than the original Omni that Omni teams up with Captain Kirk and crew to try to stop him. Okay, a little outlandish, a little ridiculous. Also, I'm not sure, but Omni might have two clones because there's a clone called The Other, capital O, that has Spock's body but Omni's mind. But I think he also has Spock's memories too. It's not really clear to me. That's one of the problems with the book. Most of this plot is, is, like I say, almost incomprehensible. And the authors will go on and on and on at length till you can barely see straight when two characters are arguing a point. At least in The Fate of the Phoenix, they dropped the really poorly conceived poker metaphors. They do bring up chess a few times, but their chess metaphors actually make a little bit of sense in this one. And they're not played up so much that they're annoying, okay? So I, I took some notes over here so I wouldn't forget anything. That's what I keep looking at. I suppose I should move the notes over here closer. Okay, so yeah, you've got, uh, so now you got a bunch of extra duplicates, okay? And as within the price of the Phoenix, it is the Kirk and Spock show. Other Star Trek characters on the Enterprise, they just don't come up. You don't really spend much time on the Enterprise at all, which was really disconcerting to me. I know that's true to the genre somewhat. Not every Star Trek episode takes place largely on the Enterprise, but those are the stories that I prefer. So McCoy has a supporting role, but it's a very small supporting role. Scott also has a supporting role, but it's even smaller than McCoy's. Uhura might have two or three lines, but at one point she is given command of the Enterprise while Kirk, Spock, and Scotty are all unavailable to do it. Chekhov is mentioned in the fate of Phoenix, which he wasn't in the Prophet of Phoenix, and Sulu is nowhere to be found. I don't know what these authors had against Sulu, but he doesn't exist in these two books, okay? So, on top of all of this, okay, on top of the, the plot line about Kirk trying to fit into the Romulan Empire and the other Kirk trying to defeat the new, even badder Omni, you've got something called the Anomaly, which is never really explained. It's just something that's hard to get into and out of. I pictured it sort of like the Mutara Nebula, Nebula from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. It might have been even more similar to the barrier at the center of the universe in Star Trek V. I don't know. It's so hastily explained, and it's so obviously just nothing more than a space MacGuffin that, uh, that I don't know, and it doesn't even matter. But there's a planet there where Ami, the original Ami, has a base, which isn't explained either. But he also has a gateway into an alternate universe. Now, when you and I think about alternate universes, we're thinking about the mirror universe. We're thinking about a universe where something is deviated, but it's still real similar to our universe, at least in terms of having characters that we know. But in this book, the alternate universe and that alternate planet is just a jungle planet with like 
prehistoric creatures that you get to fight. One of the problems is that uh, Marshak and Cobras aren't good at writing action scenes at all. And I did mark one of these that I did want to read because it was so bad that I, that I thought you should experience some of their prose for yourself. I think it's really tortured. But uh, anyway, uh, there's a Vorlat. I don't know what that is exactly. Some kind of prehistoric alien monster that Ami and Kirk are up against in the alternate universe on this planet. Suddenly, Ami saw Kirk coming with his light spear. Get back, Jim, Ami yelled. Get back. But the human kept coming. Kirk drove the spear into the Vorlat's chest with all his strength, but he had not reckoned with the beast's undying vitality. It staggered forward and pinned him against the cliff. Its saber teeth were shearing through the club Ami had jammed between them. In a moment, the Vorlat's jaws would be free and the human would be dead. Human's Kirk. In that moment, Omni found the strength. He locked his arms around the neck and twisted it. This is the worst sentence I've read in this book. The neck snapped with that peculiarly terrible sound, which could be nothing else. The animal collapsed on the human and Omni for a moment, collapsed on the animal. Then he pulled himself together and hauled the human out from under the Vorlock. Anyway, just awful. Awful. So, um, I can recommend The Price of the Phoenix. At least the writing in The Price of the Phoenix has a certain amount of muscularity and energy to it. The Fate of the Phoenix is really tedious. I did not enjoy it. I don't recommend it. If you're going to read both of them, cool. Um, but if you're only going to read one of them, read the first one, The Price of the Phoenix, which is also blessedly short. The Price of the Phoenix was only... Well, let's look here. 178 pages. But The Fate of the Phoenix lasts for 270 pages. It's it's fairly lengthy because, man, this is this is small type too, guys. I mean, look at there. Also, there's one other little quirk that I want to mention about the Phoenix novels before I close this video up, and that's this. They really love the conceit of having Kirk say, Spock. Also... And in the, both these books, and in the Prometheus design too, Spock and Kirk have some kind of telepathic bond that I never really saw any evidence of on television. But these authors love to play up that, that television bond. So, there is my review of The Fate of the Phoenix. I will be back tomorrow with a review of the Prometheus design, the third book from Sondra Marshak and Myrna Culberth. And it is not a sequel to these two. It came out in 1982. It's a really interesting book. Um, but this is part of an event called Book Trek 2023, and it's the Summer of Trek, and to participate, all you have to do is read Star Trek books. And it doesn't matter from what era, what show, just read Star Trek books. You can read one a month if you want to, post a video about it. The uh, previous years, they've had all kinds of rules, but, but that didn't seem as interesting to me. And, uh, and I'm glad they're doing it so well. Anyway, I ignored the rules last year, but I didn't make any videos anyway because I wasn't making videos yet. So, Book Trek 2023 is the brainchild of Revenant Reads, and he has multiple co-hosts helping him to administer this event. Those include The Book Clactic, Book Songs and Other Magic, read by Fred. Oh, my goodness. What did I just do there? Sorry. Whoo, Man. I don't know how that happened. It kind of reminded me when the sirens go off in the background of Steve Donahue's videos. Uh, read by Fred and, of course, Steve Donahue. So I'm not a co-host of the event. I'm just an enthusiastic participant, and uh, I'll have more videos soon.